you there, okay? Uh, but we started Romans uh, last year. We picked it up at the start of January. Romans is a very rich, theologically dense book. Um, Probably the most dense book in the scriptures. It was written by the Apostle Paul to Christians who were living in Rome during the middle of the first century. And uh, if you want to catch up on what those teachings were, uh, you can go online and catch up uh, Romans 1 through 4. But I'll recap chapter 5. Last week we wrapped up chapter 5. Let me just do a quick recap for you uh, what that was all about. The first half of chapter 5, Paul talks about his relationship with Jesus, about what our walk with Christ should look like, and how God is at work. God is at work work uh, inside of you during good times and bad. He's, he's at work inside of you before you even say yes to him. God is at work already trying to prepare your heart, pulling you, calming you, and he's at work saving people today who respond to what God is doing inside of them as well. And then last week, uh, we spent time in the last half of chapter 5 where Paul talks about the sinful condition that we're all in. And he argues that our default spiritual condition is sin. We don't come out uh, kicking and screaming and we're good little boys and girls. Our default condition, spiritually speaking, is sin. Sin is not a list of behaviors or actions. It's who we are until Christ actually changes us. And, and we, we have the, the law that Paul brings into the picture here. Whenever you see the phrase the law, in, in, in Romans especially, think Old Testament, think Deuteronomy, okay? And uh, whenever the law comes in, it makes things worse. Why? Because it actually exposes the depth of our sin. It shines a light on how sinful we are. But the good news, and Paul will end Romans 5 with this, the good news is that God shines a brighter light. God shines a brighter light for us, a bigger, better light in the person of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, how he died for us, how he set us free, how he's risen again so that we might have life. And it's the grace of God which can then come and free us from our condition of sin. And this sets us up to where we're going to go next in chapter 6. In fact, Paul's going to start chapter 6 off just like this, chapter 6, verse number 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can can show us more and more of his wonderful grace. Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Let me just kind of pause here for a moment and just camp out in this section for a little bit. Paul's going to end Romans 5 again, telling us about the law, how it increases the depth of our sin, and as a result, God gives us more grace to overcome that sin in our lives. Now Paul's going to start off showing us how decidedly different our lives should be once we say yes to Jesus. That's why he starts off with this question here uh, at the beginning of chapter 6. And it's a pretty fair question to probably ask. If you're one of Paul's readers, uh, or if you're hearing this for the first time, and you have this understanding of, well, if I sin and do the wrong thing, right, then God gives me grace to overcome that. And a fair question to probably ask, and many of his readers are probably asking this as well. Well, okay, like how, that, that, that almost doesn't make sense. If God doesn't want me to sin, but he gives me more grace, more of the good stuff to overcome sin, should I not keep sinning so that God can give me more and more of what's good? And Paul says, of course not. Absolutely in no way whatsoever should you be doing that. Because you don't have a license to, to, to keep sinning and live however you want just because God gives you more grace. You're always going to struggle with sin. You're always going to deal with temptation. Uh, we, we are going through, once you say yes to Christ, you begin this spiritual journey. The big church word for it is sanctification, right? What does that mean? It means I'm becoming more and more like Jesus, okay? And that journey is not completed this side of heaven. And so even though you have a sinful condition, which is dealt with, you still struggle with temptation. You still face some issues, some tension. You still face sin this side of heaven because we've not reached that state of perfection that you reach once you enter into God's kingdom in eternity. And so Paul says we died to sin. Very dramatic statement here. We died to sin. Your sinful condition is defeated. It is dead. When did you die to it? You died to it when you said yes to Christ. When you said yes and allowed him in your life to transform you. And so if, you, if you've died to sin, why would you want to go back to that life? And that's what Paul's asking here. Why go back? Just to revisit last week a little bit. 
Paul makes clear that our sinful condition starts because of Adam. You go all the way back to the book of Genesis, okay? Adam, Adam sins, and sin enters into the world, and so we are all starting from the same place. We all start from the same place of sin as our default spiritual condition. Then what does God do? God gives us Moses. Go to Exodus. Moses comes onto the scene, and he gives Moses the law. Get to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy actually means second law or re repetition because what Moses is doing is before Israel goes into the promised land, he is repeating the law to the people. Think of Deuteronomy as a really good, concise summation of what the law was. And, and Paul's like, hey, that, that doesn't make things better. It makes things worse because, again, that shows us just how deep our sin is. You don't know sin is sin until someone calls it out, until you can get named. You didn't know that lying and cheating was wrong until someone told you it was wrong. And now that you know that lying and cheating is wrong, to actually lie and cheat means what? means you're committing what we call a, a transgression. It's actually worse because you're knowingly, purposefully, intentionally doing what you know to be wrong, right? You're intentionally sinning at that point. That kind of ups the ante here a little bit. And the law does that. And so what Paul was saying is, look, it actually makes our depravity, our sinful condition even worse because it shows how deeply sinful we are. That's what the law does. It doesn't set you free. It just shows you, boy, you are way off. And there ain't a whole lot of hope for you. Okay? There's just not much there. No, what does God do? Well, fast forward to the Gospels. He sends Jesus. Jesus dies for our sin. Not our sins. He dies for our sin. He didn't die for your behavior or your actions. He died for the sinful condition of your heart. And if you weren't here last week, you probably said, Pastor, I don't, I don't understand that. Your behaviors are outcomes. And your outcomes result from what? This condition of your soul and your heart. Your spiritual, if I am sinful, if that's my condition, then how I act, what I say, what I do, where I go. All my outcomes are rude in sin. If my heart has been set free from, from sin, and if the Spirit of God lives within me, then here, my outcomes and how I live are very different than what I was before Christ. So that Christ dies for the condition of sin, to set you free from that. So I'm not going to preach to you to obey better or to behave better. I will tell you to belong better, have a better relationship. Have a better walk with God because that's what's going to get you further along in your spiritual development. You will look like the, the folks you kind of run with. When I was a kid growing up, my youth pastor would give us this quote, and I didn't know. It's a very famous quote. Everybody uses it, but of course, when you're 15 years old and the internet is barely alive, because it wasn't much back then, you think this is really unique just to him. But he would say, show me your friends and I'll show you your future, right? Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. He would say, why would he say that? Because, you know, the tight circle you run with, I, I would never tell you, and I haven't told you, you should cut everybody off and just have Christian everything. That's crazy. But the tight group of people you run with, your closest friends, your closest confidants, who you're vulnerable with, they need to be followers of Christ. Why? Because when I'm with those people, uh, over time, I will look and act and sound just like they do. And so if I'm going to grow my walk with Christ. I got to make sure that I've got people who I'm very close to, that I'm very vulnerable with, who are chasing after God, but also that my walk with the Lord takes precedence in my life so that I become more like Christ as well. So we died to sin, Paul says. How can we continue to live in it? Why should I trade my new way of living for my old way of living? You know, why would I trade who I am today for who Christ saved me from? I don't want to do that. See, a couple of takeaways this morning. Here's the first one. Know this, that Christ calls us to new life. Christ calls us to new life. Why, why would you get married and still live like you're single? Boy, if you get married and you're still, you know, checking out everybody on social media, and you get married, you're still going to some places around town you probably shouldn't go to, talking and flirt, you're not going to be married very long, right? Like that ain't going to happen. Why would you do that? Why, why would you? Why would you have a job but live like you're unemployed? Show up to work late, don't do your job. You know, my supervisor wants me to do this this way, but I don't like it. I'm going to do it that way. You ain't going to have a job very long, right? Like why would you do that? And yet. 
so many of us will be set free by the power of God, but we don't live in it. We still live as if, you know, who we were before Christ, we're not living and walking in that power and in that freedom. I've shared this story before, and, um, but, you know, I'll share it again because it fits well with this, with, with this, with this point. My oldest son, when he was, when he was uh, transitioning out, out of the crib to a toddler bed, we, we, we knew Noah was on the way, and we knew that, man, okay, we're going to have to make sure this crib is, 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 is for him. So we got Ezra this toddler bed, and I remember putting him in and just telling him every night, like, listen, listen, son, listen, stay in this bed, don't, don't get out. But when you wake up in the morning, get out, have fun, pull your books out, get your games, play your toys, go anywhere you want to go in the room until mommy and daddy come get you. Now, that's another message for another day about, you know, we think God restricts us, but God, God puts confines in place for a reason. That's another message for another, another day, right? But I, but I told him that. And, and, you know, it took him about a month he, he wouldn't, I would go in there in the morning, he'd still, he's in bed. He wouldn't leave. He, he'd stay in bed. About, about a month would go by, he just would not get out of, he, he treated the toddler bed like it was a crib. Even though he had freedom to get out and move around and play with his toys and do what he wanted to do. Can I tell you that there are a lot of folks, and maybe you're here this morning, whom God has set you free, but you're still stuck in the same place. You're still stuck. You haven't moved. You're still where you're at. And God's like, hey, dude, I set you free. Get up. Get out. Hey, have fun. Boy, when you come to know Christ, life is not a stick in the mud. God is a God of fun and joy. Enjoy what God's given you. Have some fun. Enjoy it. But we're still stuck really in the same place. We haven't moved. That's why you know, at Radiant Church, we have a spiritual journey. Four steps to our spiritual journey we think everyone's supposed to walk on. Number one is know God. Why? I want, we want everyone to come to know Christ and salvation. That's so important. What's number two? Find freedom. Know that you have the freedom in Christ. You don't have to live the way you've been living. You don't have to be. Hey, you've got freedom in Jesus today. Live and walk in that freedom. And just because Christ has set you free, I'll say this too. Just because he sets you free doesn't mean, you know, that you're, you're still living how you want to live. Right? We're not, we're not still living according to lust and addictions and corruption. No, 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 no. We're not doing that. But he has set us free today from those things. Christ didn't die for your behaviors. He died to transform you. God no longer, and this is important, no, he no longer sees you as the sinner you used to be. Some of you guys in the room this morning, and may I... You have this sense of, I'm, I'm a nobody, I'm a low life, I'm a sinner, I'm rotten, whatever. This like defeated mentality, and you live that way. And you live a defeated life in Christ instead of a victorious life in Christ because that's how you see yourself. But that's not how God sees you. Scripture is pretty clear that when, how God sees you is differently. When you say yes to Christ and he deals with your sin once and for all, what, how does God see you? He sees you as a son or daughter of a king. He sees you as clothed in righteousness. He sees you as the person he is calling you to be, whom he's working on to, to make you out to be. Like He sees you as somebody who's walking in complete victory. But you aren't seeing yourself that way. And until you see yourself as God sees you, you will never live a victorious life in Christ. You will live defeated. Some of you today have got to change your outlook. I am going to see myself as God sees me. He sees you not as this lost sinner. You've come home. He sees you as the adopted son or daughter in his kingdom, which we'll talk more about here later in Romans. Look at verse number three. Paul says, Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. Paul does not start with an ontological point of view. It's not, do you think... 
Do you believe? Are you sure? No, that's not how he, he didn't start that way. He starts, it's very cognitive. Have you forgotten? Do you not realize? Do you not know? In other words, this stuff should already be up here. You should know this. The Roman Christians are not new Christians. They've, they've been believers for a while. And so Paul's saying, look, you should, you should know this stuff already. This should be in your head, okay? You should understand what I'm talking about here. And then he uses this, this great imagery of baptism. When you're baptized, you're buried with Christ. This is really beautiful symbolism of the life we live for Jesus. You know, I'm, I'm, when I go into the water, my sinful condition is buried as Christ was laid in the tomb and buried. When I rise up out of the water, it is my new life in Christ, just as Christ was raised from the dead, that I now commit to living. It's, it's a very important process and step to go through. Does it save you? No. I mean, is it necessary for salvation? No, because that would be a work. But it's an important step in your journey that I believe the Lord would want you to take. In fact, we see that practice all throughout Scripture, the importance of taking that next step of water baptism. And, and that's why I encourage you to do that if you haven't done it yet. Some of you this morning, maybe you're, you're, you're in the room, you say, well, Pastor, like, I, I, I get that, but you know, I was christened as a kid, that kind of thing. And I have nothing against that. Just understand this, that christenings are, that, that they, they, they bring you into the church, depending what background you came from. They bring you into the church, not, not necessarily the full body of Christ. And, and you had no idea what was going on, right? I mean, mama and daddy kind of offered you up to your pastor, your priest, who did that kind of thing. Baptism, I fully understand what it means to follow Jesus. I fully get that. And I fully understand that as I go under and come up, it is symbolic of my old life being put to death and my new life in Christ being raised to life. And so I get baptized for two reasons. One, I am publicly declaring to everybody that I'm following Christ. I want everyone to know I'm a follower of Jesus. That's one reason. The other reason is I'm going to follow in those footsteps of Christ himself and get baptized and, and embrace this new life that God is calling me to do. And so I'd encourage you, if you've not been baptized before, we have sign-ups right now on our website. You can go there and, uh, and sign up this morning. You can also fill out a blue I have decided card. Drop it in the bucket. Hey, we'll, we'll do baptisms here hopefully before Easter, uh, but we'd love to do them again. If you haven't been baptized, we want you to follow in the example and footsteps of Christ and, and, and take that next step. Now notice Paul says that Christ was raised from the dead by God's power. He's dependent on God. You ever thought about that? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Trinity. It's a very tough thing to, to wrap your head around. You know, but, but Jesus is raised to life, not by the power of the Son, but the power of the Father. It's God the Father who raises him. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me this, that if even Jesus is dependent on God the Father to raise him on that third day, well, I certainly cannot fix things in my life. I certainly need the power of God at work inside of me. And if I try to do things on my own and try to fix it on my own and straighten out, man, the more mess I'm going to make, I need Jesus in my life to change me. I need him at work inside of me. One more thing to pull out before we move on this morning from this part of the text. Paul makes it a point to tell us it's because we've been united with Christ in his death that we're also being raised to new life. He wants his readers to know this. And I, I want you to kind of zone in on this one too. Pay attention here. He wants his readers to know this. They can participate in the new life that Christ is calling them to. Not later, but today, right now. There's a new life that God has for you today. Right now, at this moment, that you can live. We hear so many messages about heaven over the years, don't we? And, and so many of them are focused on later, 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 later. But God has that life for you to live here today. Live in the power of God today, not later. Do it now. Don't wait for, for eternity. Don't hang on. Don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. You ever heard that phrase before? You're so focused on up there. The problem when you're, when you're so focused on eternity and later and later and later and later and later is that you're not living in the power of God today, which means what? I am missing opportunity after opportunity after opportunity that is around me. 
How many people has God sent my way that I've overlooked? How many situations have I been placed in that I've not come to grips with and overlooked and looked the other way? Because I'm so focused on, well, when I get to heaven, when I get to heaven, hey, live for God and the power and the victory that Christ has for you today, right now, and take advantage of the opportunities God's put around you. Because he wants you to be at work. Embrace that life. Spiritually, we, we die with Christ on the cross. Paul says we'll be united with him in the resurrection that's like his. That's a spiritual action that has a physical result. Christ did not die solely for himself. He died so he could be raised to life from your spiritual death. But then, you know, some glad morning when this life is over, you will fly away. I'll be raised to life. I believe that I'll have that life with Christ very much, very physically, yet again. So Christ calls us to new life, and then he gives us the freedom to live that life. He calls us to new life, and he gives us the freedom to live in that new life. Look at verse number six. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin uh, might lose this power in our lives. And we're no longer slaves for sin, for when we die with Christ, we're set free the power of sin. Some of y'all got Chris Tomlin already in your mind. I'm no longer a slave. Remember my song? It's right there. That's where it comes from, right there, right? And since we die with Christ, we know what? That we'll also live with him. Now, Paul doesn't necessarily mean you're going to not face struggle and temptation. We already kind of established that today. But they can be brought to, to nothing. Brought to nothing. So in other words, they lose their power in your life, but only when you walk in the freedom that Christ brings. That's why we're no longer slaves to sin. We have more slaves right now uh, in our world than at any point in time in human history. Do you know that? We don't think very much about that. And the reason why is because we hear of slavery. We think of, you know, we're in America. We think of almost, almost 200 years ago. It was a very visible, tangible institution. But slavery in the 21st century is very invisible. You don't see it. It's, it's very behind the scenes. There are more slaves in America today than at any point in time in our nation's history. That's why we support Free International. It's one of the missions organizations that we, we partner with. What do they do? They, they set people free, particularly men, uh, women and children, right here in the States from sexual slavery. Can you imagine somebody who's been set free from a life like that? And they come up and they're like, you know, I kind of missed that life. I, was, I, I, had, I had a place to stay. I had some food. Like, I, I don't know. I kind of want to go back. Can, can I go back? Can you, can, can you imagine someone doing that? I, I, no, of course not. Like, that, that's absurd. Who would want to do that, right? That's crazy talk. And yet, again, so many of us, once you come to know Christ, we stop living in the freedom he's brought to us. We choose to go back to an old way of living, to a way of life that Christ has so, you know, died and rose again to free us from. Listen to some of these, 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 these passages where Christ has freed us. Look at John 10.10. 10. He says, the devil's come to still kill and destroy. What has Christ come to do? To give life. Give you more life. More abundantly, right? John 8, whoever the Son sets free is truly free. You're free indeed. You're free from what? Later on? No, no, no. You're free like today, right now. You're free. Power of the gospel changes hearts and lives today. You're free. So get Peter 1, 3. God's divine power. Not your ability. Not your power, but God's power. God's divine power is what can give us everything we need to live a life for Christ. It's not about us. It's about God. God has come to set you free today, man. So walk in that freedom. And here's the great thing. He has given you, whether you know it or not, He has given you a place in His kingdom. But you have to take it. You have to take it. So many won't. But you got to take it. Some scholars, Dallas Willard's kind of among them, um, you know, they, they believe that when Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount, he did not teach it in a projectile type kind of way. Like, I'm projecting you. I'm in front of you today talking. He actually got down and he, he worked the crowd. So he's walking among the crowd as he's teaching and talking about Beatitudes and that kind of thing. And as he's walking through the crowd, it was possible that he's walking through and, and he sees people and he calls them out for who they are. He's God incarnate, right? 
So he's like, hey, walk up to the, some guy. Hey, blessed are you. You're a peacemaker. Hey, blessed are you, man. Or poor in spirit. And he, you know, he knows what they're, what they're dealing with and what they're going through. He gets to somebody. Imagine he gets to somebody. Maybe, you know, puts his hand on his shoulders like, hey, blessed are you who, who are meek, right? You who are meek. You, you're the person whom, you know, culture says is at the bottom. But because of me, you can have freedom. And you can have a place in the kingdom of God today. What would that look like in our world today? Or perhaps in our world today, it might sound something like this. Hey, blessed are you who struggle with sin. Hey, blessed are you who are twice divorced. Hey, blessed are you, you've lost a job, you think you lost your house. And you know, blessed are you who everyone thinks is a nobody. Man, but God sees you and you can be a somebody. Hey, blessed are you, you have freedom and you have a place in my kingdom if you take it. You know, he gets to the, for the, the, the guys who have all the knowledge, the priests, the people who are super spiritual, the spiritual elite type kind of guys. You know, hey, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? You got, you got to get all the rules right. You got to measure and tie that all the way. You know, hey, it's because of me, me, that you can have a place in my kingdom too. That you can have freedom as well. Like you can have those things today if, if you trust in me. Jesus has come to bring freedom to everybody. He's come to bring freedom to all, no matter what your background is, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you do. Hey, he has come to bring you freedom, but you must choose that freedom. Your spot's reserved, and it's there, but you've got to take it. And will you take it today? Will you choose to say yes? Will you choose to walk in the freedom that Christ offers to you, that Christ wants to give to you? The power of the gospel that changes lives. You know, it, the power of the gospel changes hearts and changes lives and sets people free. It's not, our, it's not our obedience. It's not our works. It's not how good we do things. It's, it's all in the power of Christ. Can I tell you that we're not going to be a church that gives you a list of do's and don'ts. We're not going to be that, that kind of church. we got bigger fish to fry. We're trying to get people to see that Christ has set them free, that Christ has an offer of freedom for them. We, that, that's our mission. We're not going to be the church that gives into petty controversies about what somebody posts online. We're not going to concern ourselves about what somebody wears. We're not going to worry about what their politics are. We are the church that's on mission. The church has one mission and one mission only. And that mission is this. Go and make disciples. That's our mission. Give them Jesus. It starts with what? Reaching folks who are far from God, then helping them grow and walk in their faith as they get closer and closer to God. That's our only mission. That is all we are going to focus on here. That's why we exist as a church, to do that right there. And maybe you're here this morning and say, well, Pastor, I kind of like that other stuff. And, and I get it. And Radiance is not in the church for everybody. And if you're here today and say, Pastor, I like that other stuff. I kind of like the politics. I kind of like those kind of things. You, you, will, you will probably not be at home here. We want to focus solely on Jesus and trying to win folks to Christ and get them to grow in their faith. We do not want to get sidetracked with all this other stuff that's out there. We want people radically changed to say yes to the freedom that Christ offers, to walk in that freedom, and to see themselves as God sees them. Christ calls us to new life. He gives us the freedom to live that life, okay? And that leads us to the final call to action here today. Reconsider yourself. Just, just reflect on your life for a moment and reconsider a few things. To be clear, we're not the centerpiece of the gospel. It's not about us. Christ is the center of the gospel. It's all about him. But I want you to reconsider yourself, not to think about yourself better, but to think correctly about yourself in the manner in which God sees you. Because again, one of the bigger challenges we face, I think, is not what we believe about Jesus, but we believe about how he sees us. Look at verse number nine. We're sure of all this. Because Christ was raised from the dead, and he'll never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. So when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. 
But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. There is no plan B for the resurrection. Christ died one time. You're not going to die again. He did it once. One time. You can't send your way into needing another Savior. Christ did this thing once and for all. It's over. He'll never die again. The death he died was for all of us. Whether you're far away from God or near to God, he died for you today so that you might have freedom in him should you choose that. And that's why it's so important. Share your faith. Share your faith with folks, man. To invite people to experience Christ. I encourage you to do this today. Make this a year. As we're, we're in January. We're still in the beginning of the year. You're still praying and seeking God. Hey, make this a year where you put a, a bigger priority on sharing your faith with people, on reaching folks who are far from God. Make it a year where you, hey, you invite people to be a part of what God's doing, even, even here on a Sunday morning. You know, you can ex people experience Christ whenever they experience you. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives within you, and everywhere you go, you carry the presence of God. You ever thought about that before? And so they experience Christ when they experience you. However, there's a different experience that you have when you're together in community with everybody everybody else. And so on a Sunday, there's another level of experience folks could have. Hey, invite them to come and be a part of that on a Sunday and check it out and feel what it means to be with other folks who are pursuing and going after God. Christ did not just die and rise again for those who are believers. He died for all of us, for every one of us. Not everyone knows it. And our time is short. You don't know how long you have on this earth. You don't know how long your co-workers have. You don't know how long your neighbors have. You don't know when Christ will return. So make the most of every opportunity. Don't Bible beat somebody. Don't shout with a megaphone. Don't do that kind of thing. But take advantage of opportunities. Coworker asks what you're struggling with. You know, hey, you, you, you've had a rough week, you know, and I see that you're not really kind of ending it. Like, you're, you still have pep in your step, you know, you still have... Like, where does that come from? Well, I have joy and I have peace. And buddy, I don't have it all on my own. Here's why I have that. I have that because I have Jesus. And even though the world's kind of crazy and it feels like it's on fire sometimes, I feel pretty optimistic. How can you feel optimistic? Oh, well, I feel optimistic because I know that God controls the future and I'm good. I have peace because of that. You know, you share your, your faith in ways like that, that people see there's something different about you. Verse number 11, Paul says this, So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin, alive to God through what? Not through your knowledge, not through your works, not through your obedience, not through, through what? Through the power of Christ, through Jesus Christ. It's through Him. Such an important verse. If you're that person who writes sticky notes and puts verses on your mirror in your car, whatever, this is a verse you should probably do that with and put it somewhere. And you read that every day. Such an important text, right? Such an important one. Because you're dead to sin and alive in Christ. Boy, it's not about you. It's about what Christ has done for you. We, we want you to follow Christ. We want you to believe the message of Jesus, the gospel. I want you to believe those things. But I also want you to believe, too, what the gospel says about you. That you're alive to God because of Jesus. You're alive. One of the things that Romans will do if you're open to it and your heart is open and you get through a book like Romans, it can change some things. I've been studying Romans for many years and I've been working through the book again as we're going through this series. And every time I open it up and I dive into it, there's something I didn't see that changes me and how I view some stuff. One of those changes, I've, I've used this phrase... I think I even used it last week. I've used this phrase, I'm a sinner saved by grace, so many times. You probably have too, right? Hey, I'm, I'm just a sinner. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Again, you know what? I don't know if I should keep using that, though. Not because I'm anything special, but because that is not how God sees me. God does not see me that way. No, God sees me again as someone who was set free. 
And I could go down a laundry list of things that God set me free from. You probably could hear today too, for those of you who said yes to Christ. He set me free from those things. I'm not supposed to live like that or live with those memories. No, I'm to live in the life that he's called for me to live. I leave that behind. And now I'm pressing ahead. Paul says this elsewhere towards the goal, right? That God has before me. That's, that's how we should be living our lives, pressing ahead towards what God has for us. We are adopted sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. We should live in that manner. We should see ourselves as God sees us. Not let it go to our heads and have all kinds of spiritual pride. That makes us religious. You can't do that. But just see you as God sees you, not defeated, but victorious, not enslaved, but free. We were far from God, but now we're near, right? We were dead to sin, but now we're alive. We were blind, but now we can see, right? We have to change how we view ourselves in Christ because God sees us completely differently once we choose to surrender to him. Gabrielle, come on up. So let me ask you this today. Have you considered how you view yourself in light of how God views you? Have you considered that this morning? He doesn't call you filthy or low life. No, he sees you as righteous. You're God's most prized possession. You're the apple of his eye. If Christ had to die and rise again for one person, it was you, he would do it. He'd do it all for you. He values you. I think we struggle with that sometimes because we have a low view of ourselves. We struggle to think, why would God value me? But God values you more than you can imagine. I, becoming a parent changed the game for me. Now, some of you guys who aren't parents yet, it's hard to say, but if you're a parent in the room, you look at your kids. Boy, there's nothing your kids could do to make you love them any less, right? I mean, they frustrate you. And there are times you're like, why did I do this? Why did I, you know, I get it. God probably gets the same way with us. But you love your kids. You're always there for your kids, right? You're always there for them. And you value them over everything else. You say no to so much in your life because you love your kids, you're going to say yes to them. You know what? God views you the same way. Yeah, you frustrate him sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, let's read the story of Israel wandering in the desert. You know how many times he told Moses, I'm going to wipe all of them out right now. Like, I mean, God had those moments too, but he sees you as valuable. You matter and you're worth it. And maybe you struggle with that today. And I want you to know that God looks at you and he says, you are worth it all. I do it all over again. It's just for you. You matter to him today. Do we see ourselves as God sees us? I, I, I don't cheat on my wife, not because other women aren't beautiful or not because I don't get temptations or whatever, but I, I, don't, I remain faithful because I belong to Christ and I see myself now as God sees me. I, I, I don't lie because I, I belong to Christ and a liar is not how he describes who I am. I, I don't live enslaved to sin because I'm set free. I'm an adopted son in the kingdom of God. I'm not who I should be. I haven't arrived yet, okay? None of us have, but I'm telling you here today that I live in the freedom that God has for me because I consider myself today in the manner that God considers me, and it's a game changer. That, that lets you live a victorious life in Christ. How do, you, how do you do this morning? How are you, how you viewing yourself here today? You know? <laughs> Will you reconsider who you are? Will you reconsider how God sees you? And maybe you're here today and you can't because you haven't accepted Christ. If you're honest today, you're like, you know what? I can't quite see that because I haven't said yes to Jesus. First step on your journey you should take is to know God. Let's start there. In a moment, I'll say a prayer. I'm going to model that prayer for you. And I'll, if that's you today, you need to say it along with me. You don't have to say it out loud if you don't want to, but you want you to say it along with me. Start right there of knowing God. Now it can change you. But for others of you in the room today who are believers, you might be struggling to live that victorious life. You live what we would call a defeated life because you see yourself in a manner which God does not. That you're a nobody, that you're just a sinner, 
but you can't do anything right. There's no hope for you. Yada, 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 right? It's not how God sees you. You're one of His. And it's time you begin to see yourself as a child of God the way that He does. Bow your heads, close your eyes if you would here today. If you're here this morning and you said, Pastor, I don't know God. And I got to take that first step here today. I want to do that. We're going to say a quick prayer that is not the end all be all, I should say. But it's a prayer that begins your journey, starts your journey. We're going to make Christ our Lord and our Savior. He's our Savior who saves us from our sins. But He's our Lord because we're no longer in control of our lives. We're now surrendering ourselves to Him and we follow Him. And so that prayer is going to go like this. We're going to pray it kind of like this. Lord, I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I recognize today that I have a sinful condition that I cannot set myself free from. And I need a Savior who can change me. I need a Savior who can set me free from this sin. So Jesus, will you come into my life? Will you set me free from the sinful condition that I am in? Will you begin to change me? Will you begin to change me into the person you're calling me to be? I know you didn't die for me to live this way. I know you didn't die for me to stay this way. You died and rose again so I could be like you. And so I'm asking this morning, will you forgive me and cleanse me and set me free? But I don't want to stay where I'm at. And I live my way for a while. And it's not quite working out. And so from this day forward, I'm asking that you become Lord of my life. I'm going to surrender myself over to you. Can you lead me? Will you guide me? Will you take me where I need to go? Will you mold me and shape me to who I need to be? I'm not going to call the shots. I'm, I'm going to surrender my life over to you. I'm going to put it in your hands. And I will do all that I can from this day forward to follow after you. Be my Savior and my Lord today. Father, for those of us who are Christians in the room, we're struggling with that second step of finding freedom. Maybe we just kind of stayed put. Maybe, Lord, we haven't lived in the freedom we should live in. Maybe we've walked back to the old life that you've freed us from. Perhaps we're here today and we just see ourselves in that defeated manner, God, as stuck with sin and still enslaved to sin and not free this morning. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling in those, those different ways, God. I pray for freedom. I pray, God, for freedom. May they see the, themselves the way you see them. You've set them free. You've forgiven them. God, you've, you've, you've given them new, a new life. Your Holy Spirit's begin a, a work inside of them to change who they are. God, you, we are adopted sons and daughters of the King. May we see ourselves in that manner. May we live victorious lives in Christ and the power of God and your spirit today. May we live that way. Lord, may you use us to bring hope to those who are hopeless. God, to bring the light of Christ in the places where it's the darkest. Lord, would you use us to reach folks who are far from you? Help us, God, to, to be the people you're calling us to be to live and walk in the freedom that you sent your son to die and rise again to give us here today. Thank you for who you are, for what you've done inside of us, for all that you're going to do. We pray and ask all this in your name. Amen.